Ready, okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the North Sydney Local Planning Panel. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today, wherever we may be, and I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. The North Sydney Local Planning Panel is a New South Wales mandated local planning panel exercising the functions of North Sydney Consent Authority. And as an act pursuant to direction of the Minister for Planning issued under section 9.1 of the Act dated 23rd of February 2018. The meeting today is to consider the determination of four development applications. The first three are public. Um, they are 135 Carabella Street, Kirribilli, 34 Phillips Street, Neutral Bay, and 22 to 26 Bruce and Street, Neutral Bay, all received submissions. The final one, 315 Ernest Street, Neutral Bay, had no submissions, so will be dealt with in a closed session. Uh, no speakers. The panel members for today are myself, Helen Lockhead, uh, as the chair of today's meeting, Jan Morell, who you probably know, um, who's more often the chair, and Jared Terusi, who's another expert member. And our community representative today is Veronique Machando. Um, any, do any of the members have uh, declarations of interest to make at this time before we begin? Are there any declarations? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Veronique, do you have any? No? Um, Jan? No, Chair. Thank you. Jan, any declarations to make? No. Great. Thank you. For the information of those um, from the public, We've, provide, we've been provided with an assessment report prepared by Council, and Council have briefed us on the key issues the applications raised. We've read all your submissions, and so there's no need to repeat um, the whole content of these. I request that you re really focus on issues that may not have been covered or you do not feel have been addressed in the conditions of the um, application. If another speaker raises a point that you would like to make, again, please confirm your agreement rather than repeating the same point. The meeting is being held by teleconference and I'm requesting as panel chair that you all consider it and respectfully each other and remain on mute until you're asked to speak at the meeting. Also request that none, nobody interjects. If another piece, person is speaking, um, just to maintain um, the quorum. Today we have 12 people registered to address the panel and we'll first hear from members of the public on each matter and then we'll hear from the applicant who may like to address issues raised and just to note that the panel has been provided with copies of all your submissions. Again, so our usual practice is to allow each speaker five minutes to make their points and I also ask that each speaker be heard in silence while they're addressing the panel and that courtesy and respect is observed throughout this meeting. The panel may ask questions of the speaker to clarify our understanding of what is said, um, but after hearing from the panel, sorry, after hearing from the speakers, the panel will adjourn the meeting to confer and make our determinations. If you have registered to speak, your address to the panel will be recorded and all the panel's public meetings are recorded and uploaded to the council's website. And the audio recording will be available on council's website by the end of the week. There is to be no other recording of the meeting and any such recording may only occur with the prior permission of the panel or council. So thank you for um, listening attentively. And now we'll go to the first um, application of today, which is 135 Carabella Street, Kirribilli. And we have registered to speak um, Angus Irons on behalf of the applicant and also um, all of the Greaves. Yeah, so we've got Oliver Greaves and Jeffrey Thompson. Jeffrey Thompson, thank you, pardon. So, Jeffrey, do you want to speak first? Are you, is Jeffrey Thompson here? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Well, perhaps. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, can, can Jeffrey speak after me? He's on the other side of the room. He's He doesn't oh. have a, a, a Mac, so I've asked him to come and share mine yeah, no so um so you're oliver yes that that's so, correct oliver, you're at 137 carabella street so you why don't you go first and then we can go back to jeffrey after you okay 
Thank you very much. Number so five. Um, I guess five minutes is going to be tough for me because I'm quite long winded, but I'll try. Um, so I've got three principal issues to discuss. Number one, does this proposal meet the statutory LEP R2, quote, low density residential criteria? Secondly, has the council done its due diligence inadequately with respect to the geotechnical issues which affect the proposal itself and more importantly, affect me at 137 Carabella Street? And then thirdly, in regard to the latter concern, are the condition of the council's approvals adequate to address the risks implicit in the excavation? So regarding one, the DA anticipates a very substantial excavation. I think this is a key thing about the proposal, which is not really highlighted, which turns a two bedroom cottage into a five bedroom house with a media room and storeroom situated on a very small site. The report states that the proposed development is likely to achieve the above objectives, that is of low density residential, for the reasons stated throughout the report. I would disagree with the statement because it ignores the condition referred to as low density. A five bedroom house within the small confines of this site is not low density in my reckoning. One can imagine the number of potential occupants, including children and their impact on the neighbors, especially the occupant of 135A. So my first issue I have is, does this become a high density development on a small site, thereby breaching LEPR2? Now, regarding the second point, has the council done its due diligence on the crucial issues of the excavation which underlies the whole proposal? Paragraph 16, para, page 16, paragraph five of the report says, a geotechnical report has been submitted. I have sent to the council, and I've also forwarded to you on the planning board, another geotechnical report, which I commissioned. This second report by the well-respected Douglas Partners says the following. JK, that is 135's geotech consultant, has completed a geotech investigation. This investigation, however, was limited to hand auger boreholes and DCP tests. They go. also, they, I beg your pardon? Uh, Am I being interrupted? Madam Chair, okay, I'll carry on. This investigation, however, was limited to hand auger boreholes and DCP tests. They also note the inferred subsurface profile may be used for planning purposes, but will need to be confirmed to allow detailed design. The proposed sequence is acceptable, provided it is carried out before any retaining structure is affected or excavations carried out. Now, this is an important recommendation from Douglas Partners. It is recommended that a demolition, excavation, and construction method statement and monitoring plan be developed with hold points to ensure that the different activities are carried out in the correct sequence, inspected, and the remedial support underpinning is installed, such that stability is maintained at all times. And it goes on to talk about vibration and other issues. Um, and it, it, it talks about test pitting and the, the, the necessity to make sure that even test pitting does not actually affect stability of my house. I draw your attention to page 25 of the council's report, which concludes that, quote, the proposed development will not result in any adverse impacts on ground stability, drainage patterns, and structural integrity of the neighboring properties. Having read this, I do not understand how this conclusion is reached because I submitted the Douglas report to the council planner, which makes it clear this is not the case. The JK report is merely a planning document and is disputed in regard to several important aspects. Now that my third point, in its recommendations, the council does not mention the need for a detailed demolition, excavation and construction method statement and monitoring plan as a condition to the, to the development. Um, this belies their concern for my house and its valuable conservation features, which this proposal may well undermine unless more conservative measures are applied. In conclusion, I am not in favor of this proposal for the reasons outlined. If, however, the panel determines that the proposal should go forward, despite many valid objections, then the conditions of approval, approval must reflect any concern for damage to 137 Carabella Street. In particular, it is important that the conditions require, firstly, a detailed demolition, excavation, and construction method statement and monitoring plan, and secondly, the selection of an engineering company to un undertake such a report and monitoring exercise, which will then feed into the construction certification process and which I will approve. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, yes, 
Thank you, um, Mr. Greaves. Um, we'll just, we've noted your comments and um, we'll move on. Thank you. Thompson. Thank you. Okay, I'll go, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bit, a bit unsteady. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, um, Jeffrey, just to just to remind you that you only have five minutes, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to time it just so we make sure we give everyone the same fair share of time. Okay. Sure. So, thank you. Are you ready to start? Yes, thanks. <clears throat> My name is uh, Jeff Thompson. I, I live at 135 A Carabella Street, Kirribilli. I own the house with my daughter, Amy Quinnell, and she agrees with everything I'm going to say today. Firstly, I was wondering if the panel has read our earlier submissions. You yeah, have. Okay, that's great. I'll do it by page. On page nine, under building, it says, the proposed works, the subject of this application, have not been assessed in accordance with the National Construction Code of Australia. This would need to be undertaken prior to the issue of a construction certificate. I was just wondering whether that's been done. And if so, can we see it, please? Then on page 10, under 13.93, it says, no objection is raised to the rear balconies as they will not be visible from Carabella Street, but they are visible from my top courtyard five bedrooms and lots of people looking over our top courtyard. And therefore we object very strongly to the four balconies look, looking at, at over our court. Uh, six point on page 15, 6.10 earthworks. We want a written guarantee that if the required earthworks cause problems to 135A, that the owners of 135 will rectify and pay for repairs to our satisfaction. And what does it mean when, it's, when it's, it's, the report says the majority of the proposed works are contained within the existing building footprint? Where, all, course, where are the other proposed work to be carried out? Because it doesn't state. On page 16, under environmental criteria, we want a written guarantee also that if the proposed stormwater system does affect our drainage system, which we have designed at great expense over a number of years, that the owner of 135 will rectify and pay for repairs to our satisfaction, both outside and inside. On page 18, we don't believe a council worker can decide which is or is not a primary outdoor living area for a property at 135A. When he says the primary indoor and outdoor living areas are also on the dwelling's northern elevation. I mean, that's just crazy because we obviously do live on, on, on the um, southern as well. There was some point there in uh, the report um, that they hadn't received any comments on, on, on the revised plan, but we were not advised that we could make further submissions to the amended plans. And of course, our original concerns still remain. We have seen no plan for the proposed new rear wall. I was wondering why not? And when, we, when shall we see that? On page 22, the new site coverage is located to the rear of the dwelling and is not visible from the public domain. But what about being vis visible from the top courtyard of 135A? And therefore, we are totally opposed to the proposed three-story addition to the rear of 135 Carabella Street. While the proposed, while, while, while the proposal will result in the potential for additional overlooking at the rear, it is considered that the overall privacy impact is considered to be relatively minor in the context of the site's circumstances, subject to additional conditions. We don't want potentially a lot of people overlooking our top courtyard and uh, strongly oppose the um, idea of a three-story extension. I just have a few questions. Um, what happens if the builder 
or builders are not wholly contained within the lot of number 135 Carabella Street to in the building process. To whom do we report it to and what can be done? What happens if there are problems with our house foundations and water flow? Again, to whom do we report it to and what can be done? What happens if the right of way stroke path from Carabella Street to our property is obstructed? Again, to whom do we report it to and what can, can be done? I mean, I think it's fairly obvious that this proposed uh, extension will reduce the, the, the value of 135A and that doesn't please us at, at all. And we haven't seen a plan for where the proposed stormwater pit is going to be placed for 135. So we need to see that too. And I just don't know what the timing is going to be on all that. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greaves, um, and for keeping it succinct. Um, some of those we can address in our in camera session and um, take the conditions to address some of the issues that you've raised there. Um, we'll now hear from the applicant's representative, Angus Irons, is going to speak. Is that correct? Hi, um, Angus Irons here speaking now. Um, I am speaking on behalf of uh, my boss who has had some internet, had some uh, emergency problems, but he's now here present, Anthony yeah. Solomon. I'm um, back. Okay, he's speaking. All right. okay great. Yeah. So if, if it's, <coughs> it's okay if I speak, Madam Chairman? Yes, yes. Are all you right, able to turn your camera on at all? Or? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, it, um, it's temperamental, but uh, it is me. Um, sorry about that. Um, anyway, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and we have heard from the uh, surrounding neighbours and objectors. Uh, clearly, it's a difficult site. Uh, it's a very small existing cottage on a very small site that at some stage in its history must have been subdivided. Um, we took the view uh, when the new owners bought, bought the place that we should uh, liaise with council and, and embark on a pre-TA because clearly there was going to be issues with heritage and uh, streetscape, site coverage, everything on, on this particular site. Um, we, uh, the original pre-TA scheme actually had a first floor uh, roof, ex uh, extension in a roof, but that was, um, uh, quite quickly, uh, we realised in consultation with the heritage planner at council that that, that wouldn't uh, wouldn't happen. Uh, coun council gave us uh, a number of um, objectives to to see if we could realise them uh, in terms of when we lodged the DA and the final design. And anyway, we we uh, did do that and lodged the DA and. Subsequent to that, there have been some more changes uh, in consult with uh, council's planner and council's heritage officer. So, you know, I, I actually, although it's a very difficult project on a difficult site, we've worked in a collaborative sense with council to come up with the best possible outcome. Uh, that's that's for the people of North Sydney and for council, but also for the end users who have to live in this place for many years to come. Um, the the, the clearly pro probably the the biggest um, objection from neighbours is is the overlooking but that that exists already as I'm sure you've seen from the site inspection and so the amount of overlooking is no different to what exists now so uh, and there's more privacy on the lower level because we're literally lower down and there's a uh, wall between the two the two properties a lot of the other uh, concerns of neighbours seem to be more of the technical sense in terms of uh, drainage and excavation and, uh, and Jeffrey Katowskis, the geotechnical engineers are very um, highly accomplished um, consultants and they uh, always do a very professional job in uh, all of our jobs. So uh, in terms of um, making people feel comfortable that the, the amount of engineering that will go into this and in the subsequent CC and contract documentation will, will ensure that like there will be no no structural issues with no, uh, surrounding neighbours uh, nor hydraulic issues as well. 
but having said all that, the as I say, it's been a collaborative effort with council, and with oh, the final it? result is a a scheme that is really not seen at all from the street, and so for all intents and purposes, from the streetscape, it's still the same, but it allows the, the occupants to enjoy a family home uh, in, in a wonderful part of the world. So, you know, it, it's part of the evolution of the area, but very much keeping the heritage intact. So we, the, the only comment I make about is probably condition 19, where it's calling for solid balustrades. We did send drawings for perforated core 10 balustrades um, uh, because we just thought that pallet would work better with the, the, the building. Uh, so I, I would ask um, on condition 19, rather than a solid element, that the, the uh, perforated balustrades that, that would only have very small apertures, but at least uh, break up the, um, the balustrading from a, a solid element, which was suggested in, in that condition. But otherwise, as I've said before, it's a collaborative effort with council and uh, we, um, we, we uh, end up agreeing with their, their recommendation. <clears throat> okay, thank you, um, Anthony. Um, are there any qu questions from the panel for the applicant? Thank, 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 thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, can I just ask you in respect, you can hear, yes? Uh, yeah, I'm just asking in respect of condition C2, which is the dilapidation report for private properties, um, if we have uh, Mr. Solomon there, uh, do you have any objection to including, uh, where it says the zone of influence, this will clearly include numbers 135A and 137. Correct. Do you have any objection to those properties being identified within that condition? Uh, no, no, with... Uh... The old hands with um, dilapidation reports in North Sydney. Um, right. And also, would you have any objection to a copy of those reports being given to those respective owners? No, not at all. The, 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 the structural engineer who will carry out the dilapidation reports uh, has done many in North Sydney and will do, once again, a very good job and happy for it to be distributed amongst the neighbours. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Now, I have to make the comment to um, Mr Greaves and... Um, Mr. Thompson, that um, it's expected that they would provide access to their properties to allow the dilapidation reports to be undertaken. Yeah, that's fine. We have plenty of notice. Yes, very well. Now, I just thought I'd, I'd be, make you um, aware of, of that provision that um, it, it certainly is much better if there is um, access granted by the adjoining neighbours. Okay, then. Um, and Mr. Uh, Greaves, do you want Can to... I... Yes, can I comment on that? Um, I'm, no, it's I not so much. Not really. It's not really. A, it's not really a conversation. It's really. No, no. Okay, just... I'll, I'll answer the question. I'll answer the question. Yeah. The, 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 the engineering report that uh, the member just mentioned requires my approval under the condition. Right. I just want the, I just want that to be registered. Both the dilapidation report and the and the geotechnical report has to be require my approval, as well as theirs, of course, as to who that is. That's of that's a vital importance in terms of the conditions. That's another issue, but the question to you is, um, you would allow access to your property for the purposes of doing that report? Of course. Yes, okay, that's fine. Now I just have one further question of Mr. Solomon, please bear with me. And you mentioned that you'd prefer perforated core 10. Now what sort of transparency does that provide for? 90% or I'm just trying to understand the product? Well, that could be um, up for discussion, but the, the drawings we sent were probably about 75% solid, 25% little uh, holes basically. Yep. But you can, right, do, you can do any any aperture you like. Uh, yep. They're all laser cut. So okay. if, if council said, look, no bigger than 15 millimetres, well, we'd do it like that. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all the questions, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Any other panel members have a question? No? 
Great. Okay. Thank you very much um, for your um, presentations today. We'll now move on to um, the next application, which is 34 Phillips Street, which is the dem demolition of an existing dwelling and garage and construction of two new, a, two, a new two-storey dwelling. And the first speaker registered is Ralph O'Grady. Is Ralph here? Yes? Okay. I am, ma Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, again, just to remind you, five minutes all up. Certainly. No, I'm a little bit shorter than the rest of the gone through. Okay, uh, well, good you. afternoon, Madam Chair and panel members. Um, my name is Ralph O'Grady. I reside at 3 Reserve Street, Neutral Bay. Um, after 30 years, it's difficult to come to grips with the prospect of losing the iconic view of the Harbour Bridge and the city, which we enjoy each day. It's a part of our lives. The DA of 34 Phillips Street will block our view of the two southern pillars and looking into the roadway of the bridge itself. This is extremely magnificent during the evening hours, being a kaleidoscope of colour and the heartbeat of the city. All, our um, all from our dining table and our lounge room. It's been stated in this report, the view loss isn't significant from my living area, I can assure you that it is and is important to my family. Years ago, we did our own renovation and we were asked by council to do a raking of ceilings on our second floor. And we also had our lowered our ceiling heights uh, to accommodate two properties above us in Reserve Street to get a corridor of view. I think a superior outcome for all parties would be possible with a subtle redesign of the western side of the house at 34 to achieve improved views with a corridor for number three being my home and increased privacy for the homes in Undercliff Street. Uh, with this being said, should council be of mind to approve this development, then all recommended measures and modifications as suggested by Thomas Holman's report, need to be adopted as deferred commencement conditions at the very least. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we will hear from Dennis Moros from 53 Undercliff Street. Is Dennis here? Uh, yep. No, I'm, oh, it's, sorry, it's actually, it's Denise. Denise, it's sorry. Denise. Yeah. Sorry, your pardon. Your pardon. That's okay. You're not the only person that does that. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak about my concerns. My block is uh, particularly unusual in that it is not at the same level of the applicants. Okay. So my my property is at least a story or more below what their ground level is. Uh, so their new development height will be well above the usual height of a two-storey abode from where I'm sitting. Um, so um, uh, my backyard is a particularly lovely and serene and private place, um, and it is always in use. Um, and the new development's um, windows facing west will allow views into my backyard and into my living areas um, and also my kitchen area as well. Um, a design change in the windows to the, um, on the western side would be helpful, as would be a slight reduction in height. This would mitigate some of my privacy issues. And, but still, I'm really um, very concerned um, that any modifications um, would be not quite sufficient to um, avoid the privacy issues that, and overshadowing um, in my backyard. Um, I'd, I'd also um, feel that um, if the development is approved, um, then all those recommenda recommendations from Thomas Holman, Thomas Holman report um, would need to be um, fully adopted um, to try and mitigate any, any privacy issues. Um, that's about it. So thank you for your, for your time. Okay. 
Um, thank you. Um, we'll might just hear from the next speaker, um, Elaine Collins from 26 Hill Street. Yep, Elaine's there. Thank you, here I am. Oh, okay, great. You, you can hear me? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, panel members, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Elaine Collins of 26 Phillips Street, and I do want to begin by thanking Thomas Holman, the Council Assessment Officer, for his careful analysis and provision of some important amendments to this development proposal. I'm an immediate neighbour, have owned my home for almost 30 years, raised my children here and love the area. In fact, the development application has lots of immediate neighbours. Four of us speaking today lie directly to the west and south of the property. We've all owned our homes for more than 20 years. Please know that it's important that this development not proceed without council suggested amendments. However, I would like to suggest additional amendments which would further improve the amenity of the development with regard to my privacy and access to sunlight. My access to sunlight will be severely impacted by this proposed development, which is not fully reflected in the shadow diagrams because those are really only taken at certain times of the day. In fact, the three Western adjoining properties are all uniquely impacted regarding privacy and access to sunlight. Since as Denise mentioned prior to me, the topography is such that the ground floor of the development is already a floor higher than our ground floors. A superior outcome for at least four of the surrounding properties would be possible with a subtle redesign of the western side of the development. This would achieve enhanced views, privacy and access to sunlight and also be more in character with the surrounding style of homes in Neutral Bay. In the current design with regard to windows, there are really important conditions on the development. Crucially, these conditions mean that west facing windows on the first floor need to be modified. In particular, I applaud that windows three and four need to be either obscure glazed or with a fixed aluminium louver privacy screens. And windows seven needs to be designed with the minimum sill height of 1.5 meters above finished floor level. I would suggest that adjoining windows five and six be similarly redesigned with a minimum sill height of 1.5 meters, as they are also problematic in overlooking my kitchen, dining room and outdoor courtyard. In conclusion, should council be of a mind to approve this development, it does seem really important that all measures and modifications, as suggested in Thomas Holman's report, be adopted and that this should really be at the very least. Thank you so much for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Um, that was all very clear. Um, the next person to speak is Richard Reski. Good, good afternoon, panel members. Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> I would like to express my appreciation of Council's letter of the 20th of May, requesting additional information from the applicant and the comprehensive report by the assessment officer which provides important amendments to the development proposal. I request at the very least that the development does not proceed without these amendments. Now, due to a difference in ground levels that's already been mentioned by previous speakers, the property on 34 Phillips Street currently adversely impacts my property by reduced solar access and loss of privacy. In spite of this, the development proposals proposes a design with an additional story with extensive windows overlooking my property. I understand that a development of three stories is not a state environmental planning policy housing code complying development. The design is not in keeping with the characteristics of the surrounding properties, which are mainly federation, or arts and crafts character, and will be a glaring discontinuity in the streetscape. In particular, the proposed roof form is contrary to the predominant pitched roof forms of dwellings within the vicinity of the site. The opponents claim 
that this form of architecture is sustainable as it provides the for photographic photovoltaic panels for renewable energy production and for plants. However, <clears throat> the additional information I submitted shows that the optimal angle for photovoltaic panels in Sydney is more in keeping with the sloping roof than a flat roof. In fact, it's 34 degrees. It also reveals the roof plants will place a strain on the building's water supply. The energy required to raise the considerable amount of water necessary to the required level will significantly impact sustainability. Plants on the roof uh, will have considerable water loss due to the wind and sun on that location. I request that the suggested council amendments to the proposal be affected and further that the design of the house be additionally modified so as to mitigate the adverse impacts on my property and on local character. Thank you. Thank you. I, sorry, I didn't catch what your address was. Um, address is 51 Undercliff Street. 51 Undercliff. Thank you. Um, thank you. The next, um, the next person would, would speak would be from the applicant side. We've got Jenny Askin, town planner, Lisa Paulson, Jill Paulson, Sarah Norley, and David Selden. I don't know who is going to speak or whether you'd all like to speak. Who, Jenny? Yes. Are you going to speak? Yes, I'll be speaking. Okay. So, I mean, obviously, if you could address those concerns, and, and, and I think you also wanted to make some um, plea in, in terms of the conditions. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. My comments today relate to the consistency of the application in terms of the LEP and DCP controls and also relate to the late correspondence that I provided to the panel, which was in response to the deferred commencement conditions uh, the condition relating to height and also the conditions relating to privacy. Um, starting with height, the proposed height of eight metres that's referred to in the report relates to the height up to the air conditioning unit, which we had already agreed to be relocated. The proposal before you therefore has a height of 7.4 metres. The proposed height at 7.4 metres is more than one metre below the statutory height control. And therefore this displays a skillful design in terms of the tenacity principle relating to view loss. Notwithstanding, the applicant is willing to lower the building, but we just request that this be done um, by 300 millimetres as opposed to the recommended 400 millimetres. This reduction will still retain views from number three reserve street. And this is evident in figure 11, which is provided in the report, um, which is it's actually on the last page, as it demonstrates that a lowering of 300 would ensure that the parapet is below the ridge height of 26 under Cliff Street, which is the dwelling with the terracotta roof shown in the photograph. Um, we also request that the reference to reducing the floor to ceiling height in the condition is deleted just to allow flexibility in terms of achieving the lower height of 300 millimetres. And um, no objection is raised to the other deferred commencement conditions. With respect to privacy, we have provided in our late correspondence a sketch which proposes some alternative solutions to achieve the intention of condition C22. In relation to point A, the provision of a solid wall to the kitchen and then a planter with an increased setback to the dining room will provide visual privacy. And this is actually confirmed in the sections that we've provided with those sketches. The windows to the front section facing west do not overlook adjoining open space as indicated in the plan we've provided at VN12. And we've also shown some photographs of the adjoining dwelling that shows a roof to the outdoor area this property. In relation to other issues raised in the submissions and also raised today, we believe that these have been adequately addressed in the assessment report, but are happy to also answer any questions that the panel may have to clarify. 
So summing up, I just really want to reiterate that the proposal before you has been designed having regard to the applicable LEP and DCP controls, particularly in relation to height, setbacks, site coverage. And it's also been designed having regard to minimizing the impact on adjoining properties in terms of views, shadows, privacy, and visual bulk. Notwithstanding, we are happy to accept a further reduction in height, but just request that this be at 300 millimeters as opposed to the recommended 400 millimeters. I also have the architect in attendance and the applicants, and we're happy to answer any questions that the panel may have. Um, thank you, Jenny. Um, we, we, I think the, the panel does have a couple of questions. I'll go to Veronique. Um, you had a question about the construction, I, I know. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm just suggesting that a construction management plan may be appropriate for this development because of the uh, removal of, of everything there and the building of it, and it's in a cul-de-sac. I think a construction management plan may help to uh, focus their mind on how they're going to actually deal with this site. Would you object to that condition? Um, I, I don't think I'd have any objection to it. I'm just trying to understand the, the specifics that would be required in terms of the construction management plan. They're generally provided for sites that are difficult to access and may require traffic management and the like. Um, there may also be some conditions that have already been imposed, but in principle, I, I don't see an issue in terms of providing it. I'm not sure if the architect wants to make a comment in that regard as well. Um, yeah, I, I, look, I no objection to that, but just so you do know, um, you know, the builder that we've been speaking with would be um, very mindful of, as Jenny said, traffic management and removal of materials in a very respectful and considerate way. And we're, you know, planning to reuse a lot of the existing sandstone, um, etc. So no, no objection, but it will be well managed. Okay. Another, I think we've got another one from Gerard. Do you want to pose your question about the street elevation? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I've just got to, before I ask a question about the um, street elevation, uh, the comment you've made about reducing the height, uh, but maintaining floor to ceiling, am I making the assumption that means that's removing the actual uh, uh, landscaping on the roof to achieve that? No, that wasn't the intention, that we would still be able to provide the landscaping. It was just that within, we'd, we'd actually work within the floor to ceiling, the, the construction material between the floors. It was to give a bit of flexibility to lower that parapet to the height as recommended by council, or be it only 300 millimetres. But the intention was still to always provide that landscaping to the roof because the parapet can, it's not been altered as such, the, the planter to the parapet. So it's just basically re-engineering your, your thicknesses that's, of your slabs or um, floor levels. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, the, the other question um, was relating to uh, just the streetscape. Um, I notice on the ground floor, um, there's a fair bit of solid wall, which is addressing the street. You've got the double garage, and then you've got that wall, which is in front of the media room slash staircase. Um, and it seems that you've got some area set aside for storage behind that. Um, now, in terms of fenestration, fundamentally the only glazing you've got is glazing, which is facing the passageway in between the garage and that media room leading to the front door. Uh, the question I got would is that, would there be any objection for some of that glazing to actually slightly return around that corner? So there was glazing, which was directly facing the, uh, the street. Um, there is, just first in reply, and then I might refer to the architect again, there is some glazing provided, it's highlight glazing, it sort of goes around in a frame, as you can see, where if you look at that front elevation. You're able to give me a drawing number, if that's possible, yes, um, it's DA06. Oh, so that that high that 
very high level glazing along uh, the top of the solid wall. That's correct, yeah. Right. Um, I might just get David as well to confirm. Yeah, there's, um, there's the, the, the glazing, there's a big window along the side when you enter, and then that continues up to Safit level, wrapped around as a clerestory window, and then back down again. So it's, it's, it's creating privacy, it's creating a, an abstract wall with, with beautiful new planting in front, but then the light and the, the window articulation is sort of wrapping up and over and back down. Oh, so that actually then wraps around to the other corner of the building. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I know on, on elevation sometimes it's hard to sort of see those elements, but um, but yeah, yeah, the idea is that all those windows connect in a three dimensional way. Because just on the floor plan, I just don't see that glazing shown on in the floor plan to that corner. Yeah, that's uh, that's probably yeah. because it's up at a higher level at the first tree height. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, are there any other questions, Jan? Do you have any question or comment? No? Great. Okay, um, thank you for those comments. We'll take those all on board and um, your requests as well. So um, we'll move on to 22 to 26 Spruce and Street Neutral Bay, um, which is the demolition of three existing residential flat buildings and the construction of one residential flat building containing 11 apartments over two levels with basement car parking and landscaping. Um, first speaker registered is, oh well, the first speakers registered are Michelle and Mark Isherwood. Uh, Michelle and Mark there. Oh, I think perhaps you may be on mute. Is that correct? I think yep. it's now, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah there, you can now. Thank you. And just to, um, just to remind you that there's, you have five minutes to speak. Fine. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, my comments will focus on the risks of deep excavation of 22 to 26 Spruce Street to my property, 20 Spruce Street. The engineer's geotechnical report for the developer highlights risks to 20 Spruce and Street and 20A, which is we are part of a duplex, due to the geology of the site. The properties, that's 20, 20A and 22 to 26 Spruce and Street, sit on the same rock shelf. This, according to the Geotech report, the rock shelf varies in strength from brittle to solid. The geotechnical report rec recognises the risks to 2028 from a deep excavation and recommends actions such as placing a rock anchor under my property and vibration monitors on my walls. The recent updated DA 6721 notes the excavation at the southern boundary with 2020A will be shallower due to the car lift being removed from the plan. Plus the excavation will commence three meters from the boundary instead of 1.3. But there is no updated geotechnical report on the risks posed to 2028. So I have to assume that the risk remains the same. Now I note in the uh, report for council that there are conditions to be met by the developer. Um, in particular, these conditions require a consultant to report on the matters that I have just raised. Um, now, what I'd like to know is whether this report from the consultant will be provided to the residents who are affected by the proposal. I assume it's the, the, the same as would apply for the um, previous DA. Would that be correct, Council, in terms of the provision of a dilapidation report? And who would answer this from Council? Um, um, here we go. Um, is Mark on there, Mark Stephen? I could probably answer that question. There are um, conditions recommended in the condition set that would require 
um, the applicant to prepare comprehensive dilapidation reports, uh, and we could certainly make them available to the applicant if we just make that minor adjustment to the condition. No, it's not about dilapidation. It's it's more than the, the dilapidation report is a separate issue. This is a report about the issue of the risk posed by the excavation All right. to our property. It's uh, a separate well, report. Yeah, there's also a condition um, imposed requiring a um, comprehensive um, geotech report, and those matters would be uh, addressed in that report. And will that report be available to the residents? Effective. We, could, we could certainly make that available to the residents, certainly, as part of the condition. It just right. be a minor tinkering with the conditions, which is quite achievable. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Um, thank you. Is that is that it from you? Absolutely. The other, the other thing um, is, which might be mentioned is um, Karen Bell, who is a resident owner of um, 17 Spruce and Street, asked me to read her submission. Okay, just remember um, if we already have it, um, there's no need to repeat it because we do have it on record. Is there something? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Um, it's dated the 30th of August. So I, I don't know whether she has sent that or not. Um, Um, it, I, I have it. I think that it may there is, cover there is a what she sent. Hasn't been sent on a submission comment previously made, but I, I can't tell what the date of the previous submission was. Okay, All right. Well, then um, that's fine. Go ahead. I know, but looking at it, um, I think she has sent it to council before. Yeah. Oh, it's sorry. Previously. Yeah. Yeah, so we, yeah, we do have a list of her name and a submission received from her. So unless it's a new submission. No, I think it's the same as previously provided. Okay. I've got a message here that we didn't receive anything. Really? No. Because it's in our papers. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's in our papers that it's, um, it's a, in the pink papers we've received. Um, okay. If you want to cover it, you can. If you think it's covered. Oh, well, I'll do it so that I can say to her that I did it. I think that might be a good neighbourly thing to do. Yeah, just to be on the safe side. It's only one page, so it'll only take a minute. Yep. Uh, the hydrology report is written in a one in a hundred year drought and does not adequately address or reflect normal conditions that happen in neutral bay. Conditions have now returned to normal and underground water flow under houses from Ben Boyd Road, Phillips Street, Spruce and Street, under Spruce and Street through to 22 to 26 and down to Harbour. Amended plans do not show how deep proposed development is, what is in place to adequately manage water flow and flooding to houses behind 22 to 26 Spruce and Street and back up of underground water where natural recourse, water course is interfered with. What guarantees are in place to rectify potential damage of surrounding houses from construction, blasting, drilling, and recommended sub rock attachments under 20 and 20A Spruce and Street? This seriously interferes with the sub rock on which my house is built and 2020A is built, 30 Spruce and Street also is built on this sub rock. Carly is now on 30 Spruce and Street side of development. Spruce and Street at this point of the road is very close to its intersection. Cars can only travel single file at any given time. Spruce and Street is extremely narrow at this point. Cars park on the other side of the road. There is potential for collision with parked cars due to the narrowness of the road. Also, during peak hour cars entering and exiting from car lift will be an issue for peak hour buses traveling up and down road getting committed to their jobs. No consideration has been made for existing traffic, school traffic, pedestrians, or public transport to safely travel along Spruce Street. A high power electricity substation is sited in Phillips Street, opposite Phillips Lane. This development proposes another high power substation. 
High voltage electricity is known to be carcinogenic. The two high voltage substations will be less than 20 metres apart. What is in place to reduce potential cancer and health risks for current residents in the vicinity? Parking in Spruce and Street Neutral Bay is at a premium. How is overflow going to be managed? As I very much doubt if these luxury unit owners will rely on public transport and the weekend Sunday drive, as well as only have one car per unit. 50% of units in neutral bay are for investment purposes and are rented out. Overshadowing report shows three hours of sunlight is enjoyed each day in winter. There is a, this is a reduction of current sunlight to 20 and 28 Spruce and Street. Privacy, what measures are in place to keep current privacy for surrounding houses? Uh, lower ground units, this is lower ground units of the proposed development. As per amended plans, these units rely on life, light shafts for ventilation and sunlight. There is no outlook in winter. These lower ground units would be extremely cold and damp. What measures are in place to ensure the health of people who live in these units? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for reading that out. Um, we'll now hear from Brendan Lyon from 20A Spruce and Street. Is Brendan here? Yep. Hi, yep. Sorry, I keep forgetting which platform I'm on and go to the wrong part of the screen to turn on the camera. Yeah, it's a bit confusing. <laughs> Uh, look, I'd like to uh, thank very much the panel for your time. I'd also like to thank the uh, assessment officer who's been very diligent uh, in both his report and his site visits. And also like to thank the proponent for the adjustments that have been made and recognise that a number have been made in response to some of the objections we've raised. Uh, however, we'd like to submit that a number of issues are unresolved, which we've segmented into two families, if you will. One being unaddressed risks, uh, which have been raised by, uh, by Mark and also by the neighbour across the road. And that's effectively construction impacts and risks to our property that are not dealt with at all. Uh, and where they are dealt with in the technical reports are heavily caveated to the point uh, that they're not reliable uh, to make a decision. Similar with the water table impacts as it's been raised and as is raised indeed in the consultant's own report, uh, that will need that needed to be redone, that work needed to be redone and more extensively done uh, once rainfall patterns return to normal and groundwater uh, began to flow uh, as it now is. Again, as noted by some of the others, neither of these critical pieces of technical work have been done. Uh, and we'd also like to submit on unaddressed, what we class as unaddressed amenity impacts, effectively the significant westward expansion of the site. Uh, and while resolving that we'll still get adequate sunshine, we'd submit that that's much easier to say when it's not your living area that will be left, left unlit for large periods of the afternoon. Uh, we do submit that that should be uh, addressed. In conclusion, we thank the panel for the time and reiterate our thanks for the consideration of our issues, but submit that there are several material impacts and risks that are unaddressed. Regarding amenity, a modest redesign of the southern and northern pavilions providing a step out to the planned westward, westward boundary would provide for sunlight to be maintained or enhanced for the neighbouring properties while still achieving the substantial densification of the site and indeed mitigating the impacts on the properties located to the west. While the recommended conditions do deal with construction, water table and other risks on construction consent, we submit that they should be more properly dealt with at development approval stage, development application stage, and that this application should be refused or deferred pending resolution via proper technical studies, allowing an appropriate approval to be considered thereafter. We'd also like to submit that if the panel does deem that approval is appropriate subject to the no impact uh, provisions on our and other adjoining properties, we submit that council should insert an additional condition that council, the New South Wales Construction Commissioner or some other independent authority should hold a bond or guarantee equivalent to 100% of the replacement value of our home and any others likely to be impacted and that that remain in place over a warranty period to allow any ongoing impact such as compaction from changes 
changes to the water table to be rectified. We submit that the information properly required to allow the DA to be determined with due consideration of its impacts are lacking and that the development should have further conditions attached uh, and that that should properly be done at DA stage and not left to construction consent. Sorry, you might be on uh, mute. Yeah. It's just that I've got my timer on here, so it goes off and it's very loud. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, okay, so thank you very much, Brenda. Uh, we might just hear from all of the speakers and then the panel will ask some questions. Um, Eugene Joseph from 8 Phillips Street, if you're there, Eugene. Oh. I think you may be on mute. Sorry, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel for uh, giving us this opportunity to speak about our neighbourhood. Um, it, it does mean a lot to all of us, I'm sure. Um, so my wife and I live at 8 Phillips Street uh, with our three-month-old son. Um, yeah, our neighbours also have a young child and the, um, on the right-hand side, neighbours on the left, an elderly couple who utilise the disabled car park in front of their house. Now, with respect to the development, my main issue is um, is uh, parking and the impact that it will have on, on existing parks available. I, I will raise some points that haven't yet been raised, though. Um, so currently there's, in, in the development, in the, um, yeah, in the lot where they're seeking, where that is being sought to develop, there's about 24 bedrooms, assuming um, based on the, on, the, on the application that says there's 12 apartments that are two bedroom each. The plan is now 10 three bedroom apartments and one two bedroom apartment. So we're looking at 32 bedrooms, which is an increase of eight bedrooms. Now, obviously, an in, although they might say it's the same number of apartments, there are eight extra bedrooms. There are going to be more people living there. So we have 16 car parks for 32 bedrooms, three of them at plus three visitor car parks. Now, I assume that, um, that at least a couple of those, um, at least a couple of those car parks um, at least some of the apartments will have two. So it's probably fair to say that eight apartments will only have one car park and seven of these will be three bedrooms. One will be a two better. Um, with only three visitor spots for eight apartments, making up, making up 23 bedrooms, there will be a huge strain on parking in nearby streets. The street parking around the development site is made up of limited and unlimited car parks. There was last year, we lost a lot of car parks um, right in front of the development site due to the buses struggling um, to get around the corner. Most people, uh, particularly on Phillips and Spruce and do not have off street parking. There's a bus stop on Phillips Street and there's a bus stop on the corner of Ben Boyd Road and Phillips Street, which means there's no parking there. There's also a car, a share car park on Phillips Street, uh, sorry, a car share car park on Phillips Street and disabled car space on Phillips Street too. Now, all of the above are actually good for society and good for the neighborhood. There are costs that I think all of us are willing to pay. We're, we're willing, we wanna have uh, bus stops. Yeah, we do wanna have car parks for disabled people. We do wanna have um, yeah, car parks for car share. Those are all actually great things and I'm more than happy to lose car spaces for that. But what I don't think we're, um, we, we would consent to losing is car spaces that we have actually relied on and that are there are uh, in limited supply. So in the daytime, parking on Phillips and Spruce and Street is tough enough, but when you return at night and on weekends where there are no time limits, it is almost impossible to get a park. Currently, we have to park on Holdsworth Road and all the way on Undercliff Street because Phillips Street and Spruce and Street are actually just, um, yeah, they don't have any car parks. Now, with the increase in the number of bedrooms of the development, this will put a huge strain on the available parking because we assume that residents, some residents will park on Phillips and Spruce and, and Ben Boyd Road and other surrounding streets, assuming that, um, that at least some of the apartments have more than one car. And in regards to, there's only three visitor car parks and one of them is a car wash park. So really there's only two visitor car parks available for all those apartments. So definitely visitors will be parking on those streets as well. This, and this will be an issue during work hours, after work hours, and even on weekends. Now the next issue is, um, and, but kind of related to the same is the car park lift. 
I assume that, um, as I've seen in other buildings, that it involves a key code or something. How many visitors are really going to use this key code to park in the apartment rather than simply clogging up Phillips, Spruce and Ben Boyd Road? How many of the residents are going, are going to also just park on the street if it's easier and saves you time in um, getting a park, even if there is one available to you? And what will happen, of course, when that car park lift does not work? Those residents and visitors are going to be parking on neighbouring streets, putting further a strain on, on the limited parking. Now, and, and I'm coming um, yeah, very close to the end, so I apologise. Um, but there are just a couple of solutions and only one of them is really viable. The first would be to have something ludicrous like 24 hour time parking, which would be absolutely shocking for the neighborhood. The second would be only one parking permit per apartment, but that wouldn't really solve anything because those residents and those visitors there would simply use all the, all the non-permit parking um, in the neighborhood. So the only real solution to this problem is fewer bedrooms, and that either means less apartments or it means smaller apartments. And if you did that, then you would very likely have a development that could have a driveway that could lead to those car parks and would not impact on, you know, would not actually mean that the residents and the visitors had to park outside, um, taking up what is already a li very limited number of parks. It would also mean that the buses, which do do a great public service, can actually still get around Phillips and Spruce and Street without being impacted by people lining up to park in, to go down this car park lift. Thank you very much for your time. I, I do appreciate it. All right, you used up your time. So that was the feedback thing off. Um, so thank you, um, Mr. Joseph. Got that. Um, and there was a late submission by Andrew Gamo. Is he speaking? No? No, I, Todd Moody. No? Okay, all right. Um, must have just been a submission as yep. a speaker. Okay, so now we would hear from the applicant and um, perhaps um, if it's either Todd Moody or Greg Boston Planner who's speaking um, from the applicant's side. Yes, uh, Greg Boston, Consultant Town Planner, Madam Chair. All right, so perhaps you, I mean, you've heard what the submissions have been about and um, you've also got some um, conditions that you wanted to address. So perhaps you could respond to some of those um, issues and um, speak to your sure. request. Yes, no, look, happy to do that. Um, look, in regards to the um, concerns raised in regards to excavation and potential impacts on groundwater um, and the like, uh, Council has imposed a number of conditions, um, conditions C2 and G18 collectively require both pre and post development dilapidation reporting. Um, and we certainly raise no objections to those conditions or the um, amendment to those conditions to require copies to be provided to the adjoining property owners. Um, condition C3 has also been imposed and um, that's quite a, um, a detailed condition and it goes to the issues and that's on page, I believe, 57 of the, uh, of the agenda. It goes directly towards the additional concerns that were raised in regards to some additional geotechnical analysis, not only in terms of the substrate, but also in terms of potential groundwater impacts. Um, it also goes towards identifying appropriate excavation methodology, um, which also ties into conditions in regards to vibration monitoring um, and the like. Um, we raise no objections to, um, to condi condition C3. Um, we believe that it's appropriately applied and we also feel that it appropriately deals with the residual issues raised by the adjoining property owners. Of course, any impacts during construction um, are caught by the dilapidation reporting, and that should give the panel comfort um, moving forward in regards to um, appropriately addressing the concerns raised by the, by the neighbours. In terms of car parking, um, the site is quite challenging in terms of getting a conventional driveway um, down under the building because the site does fall away relatively steeply from the street. Uh, the original uh, scheme as submitted had two lifts, um, car lifts, one uh, located at the northern end, one at the southern end. 
um, the scheme was amended um, following advice from the um, design and excellence panel um, to remove the southern lift, which also provided for the retention of the street tree and um, just leave a single lift um, access to the basement. Car parking is in strict accordance with council's DCP provision. And to that extent, the panel can be satisfied that that concern raised by the neighbours has also um, been addressed. In regards to on-street parking, I note that there's currently two um, gutter crossings. There's two driveway accesses to the three properties. One of those driveway accesses in front of 22 Spruce and Street will actually be um, converted back to curb and guttering. Um, so um, additional on-street parking will result as a consequence of the consolidated one driveway access egress point proposed. Um, in relation to the balance of the concerns raised by the neighbours, I think the, the council report comprehensively deals with that. It also comprehensively deals with the process um, that has uh, the applicant has undertaken in terms of pre-lodgement discussions with council and obviously taking on board the um, feedback from the design excellence panel. Whilst the application relies on existing use rights, as submitted, um, the panel will be aware that the LEP has recently been amended to provide for residential flat buildings as permissible land uses on the particular site. Um, that said, the application is saved, so we still do rely on the existing use right provisions um, as the application was originally applied for. There is a 4.6 variation request in support of a, a minor building height breach that has been addressed in the report and comprehensively uh, dealt with and supported by council. Um, we believe that there are sufficient environmental planning grounds to justify the extended breach proposed. Um, I did submit a supplementary um, submission, if you like, um, just to give the panel members a bit of a heads up in terms of some conditions that I'd like you to put your mind to. Um, condition G13 requires some streetlight upgrading on streets that aren't um, in immediate proximity of the site. So I'm assuming that that is just an error in terms of the imposition of the condition. So we would ask that that be deleted. Um, condition C41 refers to the contribution to offset the loss of affordable housing. Now we put in a supplementary statement on the 18th of August, which identified a, um, that each of the two apartments to which the affordable housing SEP applies, being 22 and 24, were lawfully approved as one as containing four times one bedroom apartments. We attach the floor plans associated with, with those apartments and council has them on record. And we say that when um, applying the policy on the basis of eight times one bedroom apartments, that only six of the apartments fell below the threshold. And to that extent, the contribution as appropriately applied is for six one bedroom apartments, which is the 258,000 750. Um, that is compared to the 690,000 applied by council on the basis that um, they believe that um, over time the apartments have been used for two bedroom apartments, not one bedroom as originally lawfully approved. Um, council does say um, on uh, uh, in, I think it's page 18 of the assessment report, that if the panel agrees with the proponent that as lawfully constructed and lawfully used, they were eight foot one bedroom apartments, that only six of um, the uh, dwellings are uh, deemed low, re low rental and accordingly um, the levy as uh, calculated by the proponent should prevail and that is the $258,000 levy. Uh, we certainly ask the panel to put your mind to that, noting, noting that the definition of a low rental residential building relates to its lawful use and where the contribution is applied on the basis of a replacement cost value of the building, um, that it would be unreasonable for the panel to impose um, the um, replacement value on the basis of two bedroom apartments when that was certainly not the lawful approved use. Um, we would also ask that um, the panel put their mind towards um, enabling the deferral um, of the payment of the contribution to prior to uh, occupation certificate. There is certainly no prescriptive requirement for it to be paid prior to issue of the construction certificate. We are happy to pay the section 712 contributions upfront. 
However, do ask for deferral of those particular um, contributions. Condition 43 um, would also uh, need to be amended if the panel was of a mind to modify that condition just to reflect the modified contribution amount. Finally, in relation to um, condition 42, which is the resident relocation plan, these properties were settled on the 20th of December 2019. There was already a, an application before council and before the court for a similar development. Um, that was ultimately refused by the court. This application was subsequently prepared and submitted. Since settlement, um, the um, prospect of works commencing um, in a reasonably short time frame um, has been real. And to that extent, all, all um, apartments across the three sites since that date have been leased out for temporary short-term accommodation for periods not exceeding three months. And on that basis, there, is, there are just no residents to which the set would apply that require relocation. Um, to that extent, we ask that condition C42 be deleted on the basis that it simply doesn't serve a plan and purpose as it relates to the affordable rental housing set. Um, apart from that, I appreciate um, you giving me the opportunity to address and to provide that late correspondence and happy to answer any questions that might arise. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, panel, are there any questions or, or I think Gerard, you might have had a question. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, look, in, um, in considering uh, obviously all the issues and if the panel is mindful of um, approving it, I guess the question I have got is a bit more specific in terms of the balconies on levels, um, uh, the top two levels, not the ground level apartments. Um, you do have privacy screens, which seem to be partly located on the southern side of those um, balconies. Uh, would there be any objections if they were extended to the actual corners of that southern edge of those balconies to protect visual privacy to uh, the each of those individual balconies? Yeah, I'm just just pulling up the plans. Uh, it's drawing number two, o two o four seven six. O two o four was it? A ground floor plan. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's the fixed privacy screens on the northern and southern edges of the building, extending that's to correct. the edges of the balconies. Yes. Um, yeah, look, I if the panel was of a mind to impose a condition such as that, um, I certainly um, wouldn't oppose it. I'm not sure if it needs to extend to the very end or potentially if you have a look at the balcony, there's a, there's a, a black solid element um, at the, um, on one of the edges of the balcony if it extended out to that similar alignment. Um, the, the living rooms do rely on solar access um, from that direction in the afternoon. Um, so I'm just mindful not to um, not to um, jeopardise the amount of sure. solar access. No, I'm, I'm conscious of that, but reviewing your, your solar plans, it would indicate to me if they were extended to before the curve, uh, before you get to the western side, that wouldn't uh, create any uh, issues in terms of overshadowing to your balconies nor to the glazing to your living areas sure. based on your solar diagrams. Yeah, look, if the panels have a mind to impose a condition, I would be comfortable with that. Thank you. Any other um, questions from the panel? No, thank you. Okay. Veronica? Okay, great. Well, I think that brings to an end um, the um, issues for the public meeting. So I thank you all for your um, attendance and your submissions today and we'll be taking notes and we've got all your comments on board and we'll certainly take them into account when we're making our deliberations so thank you and uh, a record of this will be available on council's website by the end of the week thank you